today, it's all about the joy of dogs. Kate Lever is a journalist, and she's at home right now with her dog, which she picked up years ago from a rescue shelter. Humans have been living alongside dogs for thousands and thousands of years now, and they've helped humans to hunt and to herd other animals and to protect us from harm. And of course, they bring us the joy and the humour of their companionship. Kate Lever is certain that her dog has made her life saner and happier. So she's been looking into the science of the human response to dogs and their response to us as well. And she's discovered that dogs are now being used for all kinds of therapeutic purposes in courtrooms, classrooms, hospitals and prisons. She thinks that dogs bring out our best selves and help people live their best lives. And her book is called Good Dog, Celebrating the Dogs Who Change and Sometimes Even Save Our Lives. Hello, Kate. Hello. There's that old saying, it's an old joke, that dogs have owners while cats have staff. <laughs> now, cats haven't been with humans as long as dogs have. What do you know about how humans manage to become friends with, with a dog, which is essentially a descendant of a wolf? Yeah, so it really depends which scientist you speak to, but somewhere between 14,000 and 33,000 years ago, wolves started following human beings around. Now, we assume it's because they were looking for scraps of food, maybe companionship at a stretch, um, but they sort of, humans started taking notice of them. Perhaps they hunted together, we're not sure. There's definitely some disagreement there amongst experts. But essentially, it was less survival of the fittest and more survival of the cutest. What do you mean? <laughs> well, over time, uh, humans kind of became companions with the friendliest of the wolves and eventually started breeding the most docile uh, wolves with each other to be, sort of create this cuter and cuter species, which eventually evolved to become the dog we know as our household pet. Have we been selecting dogs for their adorableness, Kate, yes. over millennia? I would say so, yes. And, you know, I have to say that's not always wonderful. I think there are certain dogs like pugs and a lot of those very sort of uh, flat-faced dogs that have difficulty breathing mm. that have been bred to be so cute that they're no longer sort of the healthiest dogs. But in a lot of ways, we just have very sweet companions now because we've bred them for adorability, if that's a word. Yeah, because a wolf is not sweet. A wolf is, no. is, is so independent of spirit and so pragmatic and so attuned to living in the wild. It seems extraordinary that dogs should have evolved from such a creature. Yeah, when I take my Shih Tzu for a walk down the park and I sometimes think about the fact that he evolved from a wolf, it just seems so bizarre. But then, <laughs> but then a husky will walk past and I think, you know what, I can picture that. I can see that connection. Um, so it is a funny thing, but, um, you know, we've, we've kind of bred them for our own purposes, but I think they're quite pleased with the companionship that we give them as well. Is there any suggestion that humans have evolved towards dogs a bit? Yeah, actually there is really interestingly. Apparently it's sort of in our sense of smell. So apparently our sense of smell is not as strong as it could have been otherwise because we had wolves and then later dogs by our side who did a lot of the sort of sniffing out of things for us and helped in a kind of as a sort of hunting assistant if you will so we, we, we may well have outsourced our sense a, a more powerful sense of smell to dogs this is why this is why to a dog uh, the outside world is perceived in a very different way to the way we perceive it the outside world is this giant aromatic garden to them isn't it <laughs> yeah absolutely it's sort of interesting because they they sort of stop and start when you take them on a walk because there are so many important smells. And I had someone explain it to me once that it's sort of like their version of checking in on social media because they're just checking who else has been at that location um, and who has been there recently. And they have to also, you know, leave evidence that they have been there. It's very important to them. When humans began to migrate out of Africa and then travel throughout the rest of the world. Did they bring dogs with them as they travelled? Yeah, there is some evidence that, should, that suggests they did bring dogs with them when they travelled. And we have evidence also from around that time, from thousands of years ago, I think 8,000 years ago in Siberia and 14,000 years ago in Germany, we have evidence of dogs being buried next to human beings and tests 
suggests that they ate the same food as the human beings, which kind of that's a proximity in death that implies a proximity in life and implies also that they were sort of treated um, especially as as companions and almost as equals. They're buried side by side that long ago. Yeah, yeah. There's really no other reason that you can extrapolate from that other than a respect for the animal. Tell me about this Japanese study you discovered into humans, dogs and wolves and the effect that (laughs) all three have upon each other. Yeah, so there's a 2015 study in Japan um, where this uh, academic decided to look into the emotional connection between human beings and dogs. And he had this idea that um, sustained eye contact between animals and human beings would cause an, a feedback loop of oxytocin between those two creatures. So he basically got in some people who have pet dogs and strangely enough, I don't know where he found them, got in some people who have pet wolves and he basically got them to stare into their pet's eyes for around 30 minutes and then and uh, did a urine test first, got them to stare into each other in each other's eyes for 30 minutes and then did another urine test to test the levels of oxytocin. And of course, oxytocin is that lovely hormone that's known as the cuddle hormone or the hug hormone um, that makes us feel safe and warm and loved and trusting. It's very important in the development of attachment between babies and mothers and fathers for that matter. Um, so this test showed that after the 30 minutes of eye contact between dogs and their their human beings, that the dog's levels of oxytocin rose by 130% and the human's oxytocin levels rose by 300%. 300%, yeah, it's quite it's quite significant. And there was no uh, change in the oxytocin levels of the people trying to make contact, eye contact with a wolf. I've never tried to make eye contact with a wolf, but I imagine it's not as easy as doing it with you know, a poodle. So this is why dog owners call their dogs their fur babies at times. It is a a similar kind of relationship then. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think because oxytocin is very important in terms of building trust between two creatures. Um, And usually we talk about it between parents and their children because certainly making eye contact but also making physical contact, um, physical affection triggers the release of oxytocin in our bodies as well. So that's how people build a certain level of trust in a relationship. How about you, Kate? Do you rely on your dog for your sense of well-being? I really do. So I have a Shih Tzu. He's turning three next month. His name is Bertie or Bert to his friends, Gilbert or Herbert on formal occasions. And yeah, I really do rely on him for my sense of well-being, particularly at the moment while we're going through this pandemic and having to isolate and the anxiety that's associated with that. I found him more helpful than usual. Um, I also live with bipolar disorder and regularly kind of slip into periods of depression. And during those periods, I find him extremely helpful and comforting and soothing. And I rely on him, you know, powerfully for my sense of well-being. How does he help? Well, he sets he sets a routine. So I wake up in the morning. The first thing I do is let him into our bedroom for morning cuddles, which kind of sets the tone for my day. I'm an insomniac, so I often am quite anxious in the morning because I haven't slept. But for some reason, having Bertie like snuggle into my chest and put his head on my shoulder just makes me feel like the day is going to be all right and it's going to be okay to be awake. And then we go for a walk, which just gets me out of the house, which I might not otherwise do if my mood is low. Um, (laughs) You know, I think particularly when you're going through depression, the instinct is to hibernate. Um, And then throughout the day, he basically snoozes. Shih tzus typically sleep for about 16 or 17 hours a day, if you can believe that. He's a a very gifted sleeper, so he doesn't bother me while while I work. But then in the evening, once I've put my laptop away, if he can sense that I'm anxious, he will just lie his body across my chest and stay there until I feel better. And the last thing I do at night is is have a snuggle before bedtime. So my day is very much punctuated by affection and activity with my dog. And those are the ways he kind of comforts me. But particularly, I think I have a very strong sense that he knows when I am depressed or anxious, whether he can smell it or whether he can simply sense it from my body language. I believe he knows and he is capable of empathy and tries to help. You know, Australians tend to, we tend to keep to ourselves. We don't really talk to our neighbours much, but there's a dog park just around the corner from my house. Mm. And I do notice 
that as people walk their dogs, it's a nice way to chat with strangers. Absolutely. And also you can get away too. It's, it, it doesn't trap you. You can sort of hang around with the dog in the park, but if you need to get away, you can get, get away. It's, it seems to be a, a kind of a very unstressful way of meeting and chatting with strangers that you can sort of come and go from as you please. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, I have some genuinely lovely connections with neighbours and people who live in the neighbourhood around me for that very reason, because you automatically know that that other person is a dog person, so you have something in common and something you tend to care about a lot. Um, it's quite rare to find a dog owner that doesn't want to stop and have a you know let let their animal have a little sniff around, and you usually exchange a couple of pleasantries. I've had real proper long conversations with someone just because our dogs have had a chat. I mean, when we lived in London, there's a schnauzer on my street um, who belongs to a man named Simon who would no you know like not regularly be my friend. He's in a different age group. He's in a different industry. There's no reason for us to have a connection apart from the fact that we both have dogs and we regularly update each other on our lives and it's completely delightful. Kate, when did you first cast eyes on your dog, Bertie? I became obsessed with having a dog and not just a dog but a shih tzu. Why? Why a shih tzu? I, I, do, I adopted a an elderly shih tzu um, who I, I named Lady Floffington when I was last living in Sydney when I was about <laughs> – I was in my mid-twenties. <laughs> Lady Floffington. Lady Floffington. Her silent mid, middle name was Beyonce. And you were fine with shouting out in the street, Lady Floffington, come here, darling. Yeah, I don't think I thought it through when I named her that. <laughs> So I often shortened it just to Lady, which I think was more acceptable because of the Disney movie. But I, I adopted her. She was my first dog as an adult, and I adopted her from a lovely place in Sydney. And I had her for about six years. I got her when she was about eight, and she had barely any teeth and all sorts of sort of hip issues and back issues. And she farted violently and snored most of the day, but I loved her. I just adored her. <laughs> And um, and when she died, it really devastated me and I went through, you know, real proper grief. And I just, I don't know, I just, I think out of respect for her, I wanted to get the same breed. Um, unfortunately, at the time, my boyfriend had other ideas. I changed boyfriends between the two dogs um, and the boyfriend I have uh, currently um, had never had a dog before in his life and had this idea of having kind of like this classic spaniel type dog with a proper snout who would go for a, long runs. A man runs. dog. A man dog, exactly, exactly. So I had to do some real sort of convincing to get to get him around and on board with the Shih Tzu idea because they are ridiculous animals. They're very flat-faced, tiny legs, very lazy, very sleepy. Um, but to me, the as I say, the ultimate in cuteness. Um, so I was living in London at the time and I, my main hobby at the time was scouring rescue websites to try and find a Shih Tzu. And I eventually, one, late one night, on a Friday night, my boyfriend was working late, um, I found one on the Battersea website. Battersea is probably the leading dog rescue shelter in the UK. And I found one called Mongo, who was about nine months old, they estimated. And... Um, I just, there were four pictures of him online and I just completely became obsessed with him instantly and knew he had to be mine. And I sent within the, a period of two or three hours, I think I sent 63 messages to my boyfriend, including just deranged like portraits I'd made using the four photos that were available online, um, you know, writing text bubbles above the pictures saying, come and pick me up, Jono, which is my boyfriend's name, and why won't you love wow. me? Yeah, it was real. I really went to town. And by the time he got home that night, I'd printed out A4 pictures of the dog and put them under his pillow um, and in the bathroom cabinet. I really just lost my mind with how much I wanted this dog. <laughs> but it worked. I um, actually went on my boyfriend's birthday to go and meet him. There was a little bit of a hiccup because you have to reserve a dog at a shelter in, in, in order to go and meet them. And we reserve, I tried to reserve this dog by email, but someone else got there by phone before me. So we went out there to meet him only to be turned around. Oh, was that devastating? It was, it was, it was devastating. It was, I had imagined a future with him for the rest of his life. I mean, it was a real scene. It was snowing that day. We were all rugged up. I was sitting on a bench sobbing, and I said to him, it's a rough game, talking about <laughs> the pet adoption game. 
But as it happened, they called me back the next day because the family who had wanted to adopt him already had a dog and uh, Mungo, or who we re- later renamed Bertie, was very rude to their existing dog, so it wasn't appropriate for them to adopt him. So they rang and said, do you still want him? He didn't want them. He wanted you. He wanted us, exactly. I believe in no other type of fate except for dog fate. And what happened when you got him home? What state was he in? He, um, he's got some missing teeth. He had a skin infection that had just been cleared up by the angels who looked after him at Battersea. But he had he would howl through the night and he had a rather nasty biting habit. For some reason, I think because he sensed I was the weaker of the two of us, he would attack me. Um, so he, he bit me quite a number of times, mostly on the arms, once on the nipple, which I have to say was very unpleasant. And we did wonder what we had done. Why was he like that, Kate? What kind of home had he been rescued from? Um, well, at the time, we were actually told he was found as a stray, which never made sense to me because I don't think, knowing his nature and his level of sense, I, I didn't think he would be able to survive a British winter on his own on the streets. We actually found out later that he was actually confiscated from a hoarder um, with two other dogs, and they were not fed properly or cared for properly and the dogs didn't get on presumably because they had to compete for food so he is very frightened of dogs was never socialized with human beings or other puppies and just was sort of aggressive and scared I think but we solved it ultimately it took us a couple of months but we basically looked up what to do if your puppy is biting you and essentially they they don't want to hurt you they just don't know the level of their own strength so google told us to squeal like a puppy every time he bit us um so you kind of just make a yelping noise every time they bite you and they learn that way as if they would learn from their other their puppy siblings if they were in a litter they learn what level of bite they can get away with before it actually hurts you. And so he just basically stopped doing it. And I think it was a combination of probably the yelping training, but also just uh, consistent love and knowing he has somewhere warm to sleep and knowing he had food every morning and evening, perhaps. But he just stopped doing it. And, And now he wouldn't even dream of biting me. You think he can smell depression. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it sounds like a fairly outlandish theory. Um, I guess I, I just, I truly believe that he knows when I am distressed. And my greatest theory, just knowing how dogs operate, is that he can smell depression. And I spoke to a gentleman called Stanley Cohen. Who's, he's one of, he's from Canada, but he's one of the world's leading dog experts. And I thankfully got in touch with him and said to him, so (laughs) what about this theory of mine that dogs can smell depression? And he said, you know what, Kate, like it's not as silly as you think it sounds. It's entirely possible that dogs could smell depression. For all we know, depression has a smell that we cannot detect as human beings because we have dogs who can smell cancer. We have dogs who can smell Parkinson's disease. So there's really no reason why they couldn't be able to smell something in someone who is depressed. Equally, it could be that they can smell a release of the stress hormone cortisol, so they could just know that something is wrong. It also may not be smell related. It may simply be that I am slouching and not leaving the house and moving around in a kind of morose way and he picks up from that body language and the general vibe I'm giving off that something is wrong. But, I, you know, I like the smell theory. Does the fact that he responds to it in such a such a I don't what's the adjective for it kind I don't know can, can we say dog dogs have empathy Yeah yeah so there's a really lovely study that I looked into that tried to test whether dogs are capable of basic empathy and essentially over a period of time with all sorts of controls to make it legitimate they played dogs a series of different sounds some of which were neutral like an insect or the ocean um, some of which were negative like the sound of a whining dog or a crying human and some of which were positive like the sound of a, of a laughing person or or a happy dog and they tried to test the reactions in the dogs and basically they did find that they reacted a lot more and displayed things like shaking and freezing um, which happens when they're distressed um, and barking of course you'd imagine when they were played those negative noises and particularly when it was a human being 
or a dog. So the scientists basically concluded that dogs are indeed capable of empathy, not only for their own species, but for ours as well, which I think is really interesting, but also not surprising. It implies they have a kind of moral imagination, or, or, is it, or am I overthinking this, Kate? I don't know. Like, like it, it can get inside your head or something and, and, and understand what you're going through, or is it something other than that? I don't know. I don't know either, and if anyone's overthinking it, it's definitely me. <laughs> um, I, I like to, I sort of, I, I am aware that I project some very human expectations of emotional maturity onto my dog and other animals. But, you know, I I think a lot of us underestimate dogs and their potential to feel emotion and, and perhaps, as you say, even have a moral imagination. When I'm being more pragmatic and realistic, I I do understand that perhaps Bert just has an instinct that something is wrong, I will help. Maybe he just sort of likes the snuggles, likes being near me, and his own it's out of his own self interest. But I think um, I think it's more than that personally. So this has got you thinking about the joy of dogs, yes, and the things that dogs do to help us in ways that not a lot of people are necessarily aware of. Tell me about Missy, the autism support dog. So I met this charming 11-year-old boy called Cody and his mother, Jill. Uh, His mum was wearing a T-shirt that said, I'd rather be walking my pug. And I believe it's not the only pug-related clothing that she owns. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But basically, Cody has quite severe autism. He's really struggled to stay in school. He's often told his parents that he wanted to hurt himself. Um, And he's really gone through quite a struggle of a childhood because of his condition. Often, uh, autistic people form a particular sort of area of interest that they become really interested in. For him, it has always been pugs. He's just always gravitated towards them. Before he even met a pug, he knew as much information as he could possibly get about pugs. His bedroom is covered in pugs. He has pet pug linen, pug toys, pug money bank, whatever you can think of. He's got a pug version of it. And this was all before he even had a pug this in his was life? before he had a pug. Um, and he would go to school and whenever he would get distressed, his teacher would ask him to take out a little scrapbook he'd prepared earlier, which just had pictures of pugs and said things like, imagine patting a pug and imagine what it would feel like to sit with a pug and think like the pug, you know, just very sweet aspirational things to do with pugs. And it really helped him. And then one year, it was his birthday, um, he just sort of had a particular flare up of not being very well. And his mother had not been very well from the stress of trying to look after him. And it was his birthday and she didn't know how to celebrate and a party didn't seem appropriate. So she went online on her Facebook and just said, my son really loves pugs. If you have a pug, can you send photos? And she found a pug forum that runs pug events. And basically, she just had this remarkable, beautiful influx of pug pictures and people asking for their address so they could send pug photos and pug toys and pug cards. Um, And ultimately, that led to the the little boy going to a pug event, a pug pub event. (laughs) A lot of pugs turned up and he was transformed. Usually, he's extremely socially anxious. He must have lost his mind. He was so excited. He did. Well, imagine imagine spending, you know, the first decade of your life obsessing over pugs and then getting to be in a room where you're literally surrounded by pugs. Apparently, he just became a different child and was sort of like going up to adults and being like, nice to meet you, nice to see you. And he was charming and sociable and happy. And his mom just sort of turned to her husband and said, we're going to need to get a pug. And that's how Missy came into their lives. Missy is deaf. Uh, she was about five years old when they got her. She <laughs> She's one of those pugs whose tongue is perpetually outside of her mouth. So just I forget if it's the left or right, but her tongue is always just lolling to one side of her face. And she... Their house is covered, every surface is covered with pug hair. I went to visit them and spent some time with them and I left completely head to toe covered in messy hair. (laughs) I didn't mind at all. She was the sweetest, (laughs) sweetest little thing. But she has, you know, allowed this young boy, Cody, to live his best life because he wakes up in the morning, takes her for a walk, you know, feels confident enough to go to school because he knows he can come back and see her. His mum was campaigning to have his school allow him to take her with him. I don't know if that's happened, but, I, you know, he's sort of living a much better quality life because he has Missy in it. 
So he's a he has autism, which means he's in, every once in a while he might have a, a total freak out. Does Missy really help him with that? Yeah, absolutely. It kind of she grounds him. So if she if he has one of those sort of episodes which might be distress, might be anger, might be sadness. He just needs to get on the ground and be at Missy's level and stroke her and allow her to lick him and just have a cuddle and breathe and ground himself and remind himself that he's got her. And it just, cha- you know, diffuses the whole situation. I like the fact that Missy too is someone who needed a bit of help. Yeah, they both needed a bit of help. She did. She she was bred we used to breed babies and kept outside the house in not ideal circumstances. So it was quite a pleasant matchmaking for this family to have found her. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler on ABC Radio. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. There's a dog called Echo who helps kids to read. How did Echo come into into the story? So Echo is a Labrador who lives in Northern Ireland and belongs to a delightful woman called Aideen. And Aideen very sadly found out that she and her husband were incapable of having a child. And she was going through the process of grieving that revelation when her mother-in-law suggested that perhaps they could get a dog so that they would have someone to care for. And she thought that would be a lovely idea. And her husband said, you know what, I'm on board so long as you can find some way for the dog to be looked after during the day, because I don't want to just get a dog and leave it at home uh, while we go to work every day. So he wanted a dog with a day job, in other words. Yeah, exactly. A dog with a day job, precisely. And I think he probably thought that was his way of getting out of the whole dog situation. But Aideen was smarter than that. Aideen is a, a, a primary school teacher at a special needs school in Northern Ireland. And And she looked into whether she could get a dog who would be able to come to work with her every day. So she contacted this woman called Geraldine at a a charity in Northern Ireland. Um, It's basically two women, two remarkable women who run this whole um, training academy where they train, they breed and train dogs to work in schools, to work with autistic families and also to work in prisons. And in this case, Aideen just got in touch with Geraldine and they match made her with this dog called Echo and Echo now goes to work, is trained as a therapy dog, but goes to work with Aideen every day and um, has a special room where Echo meets with children, special needs children and particularly children who have trouble reading and doing their homework and doing maths and all the stuff that's required of a primary school child. And how does he help them with that? How on earth does a dog help with that? It's not immediately obvious. There's plenty of evidence actually and it's quite a common thing that children improve their reading skills and their literacy skills and their comprehension and their speaking out loud and their confidence and also their enjoyment of reading when they read to an animal. But it's also quite remarkable outside of the academic improvement that children see, often there's an emotional or psychological side to the support that that dog gives them. Um, In Echo's case, um, he was able to help several children get through distressing personal circumstances that they were in um, and sort of divulge personal information to teachers once they felt comfortable around the dog. There was a little girl whose mother had died but the dad did not inform any teachers, so they just didn't understand why this girl was suddenly detached and very distressed. Um, And she went to spend time with Echo, and it was only after she'd spent sort of 20 minutes, half an hour with Echo, that she felt comfortable to whisper to the dog, Echo, my mommy has died. And during those sessions with Echo, there's always a supervising teacher in the background. And so that teacher then was able to have a conversation with the child about the fact that her mom had died and they were able to treat her appropriately for someone who was going through that awful situation. 
then there were other examples of grieving children or children who were distressed in some way who were felt able to disclose what they were going through purely because they were comfortable around Echo. Kate, okay, when the children read to this lovely dog, mm. what is the, does the dog react? Does the dog interact with them? Well, I think the dog just sits there patiently and appears to listen because they will sit obediently and watch the child read. But usually these children are at a developmental stage where they believe that animals are capable of listening and understanding the English language and human speech. So it's kind of this perfect pairing of beast and child because the animal gives the impression of listening and being a very attentive listener because they're trained as therapy dogs to be impeccably well behaved. And the child is there reading to a captive audience and believing because that's just where they are with their imagination and their brain development that that dog is engaging in what they're talking about. Um, there, there's really some really lovely information from some studies that were done into therapy dogs who help children read, where dogs apparently prick their ears up when they hear the word badger or raccoon or cookie. And the, the children take that as evidence that the dog is enjoying the story. <laughs> um, and they often will choose stories that are to do with cats or cheese or dogs, you know, specifically because they truly do believe that the, the dog is listening. So it's this kind of magical relationship based on a child's imagination and a dog's obedience. Tell me what happens when dogs... Therapy dogs are introduced to prisons. Ah, so it's actually the same charity in Northern Ireland, and it's a dog that I met called Jingles. Um, and Jingles is a particularly effusive Labrador. And he, there was basically a woman who was working in a prison in quite a senior capacity with inmates in a medium security men's prison, and she just wondered what kind of good a dog could do in that situation. You know, she was dealing with um, hardened criminals and men who were capable of unspeakable things, And but she had compassion for them and she wanted them to, you know, follow through on the promise of not reoffending once they had finished their sentence. And she looked into the possibility of getting a dog that could work as a therapy dog in the prisons, and that's how Jingles came about. Um, I met a a young man called Barry, known as Wee Barry, because Irish people like to use the word wee in front of every yeah. other word. <laughs> and you would have been wee Kate, no matter how tall exactly, you are, I expect exactly. too. Exactly. <laughs> um, and he's in his early 20s and he was in prison for arson um, and has been in and out of the prison system most of his adult life and had a very difficult childhood and is you know, despite being um, a criminal who has done awful things, is a very sweet and vulnerable man. He um, has autism and anxiety and desperately wants to get better as a person and not commit crimes anymore. Um, at the time I met him, his sister was pregnant and he was desperate to be a proper uncle and be out of jail so he could be there for his nephew or niece. And he basically books in with the mental health services to take Jingles for a walk or have Jingles accompany him to various appointments that he has in jail. And he basically lives for those appointments. Um, on, on days he's not seeing Jingles, he will often try and hurt himself, but he would never do that on a day he's seeing the dog because he so looks forward to that meeting. Um, and he actually is thinking of taking the prison up on their offer of learning to become a dog trainer, which would give him an employable skill once he leaves prison. So it's this kind of multi-layered, lovely set of benefits for him. Um, companionship, he feels like the dog needs him. Um, he feels like the dog is happy to see him. And, you know, this is a person who doesn't feel like many people in his life are ever happy to see him. And it's sort of, it's very interesting once you look into the area of therapy dogs who live in prisons, who who work in prisons, because um, there are several programs in America particularly um, where rescue dogs are sent into prisons um, to be trained by inmates and it becomes the inmate's job to care for the dog and to train them and they train them with all sorts of tricks that they can do um, and give them a home as well. And it sort of, it comes up with all these interesting moral questions of whether, 
you know, whether an inmate is an appropriate caretaker for a dog. That's the thing, isn't it? Um, the, the problems of putting uh, a dog in the care of someone who might be a violent criminal or has mm. been a violent criminal. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Is there any evidence, though, that having a dog in a prison might help with rehabilitation, with violent behaviour or antisocial behaviour? Yeah. I mean, um, there are some shocking reoffending rates, um, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but across all sorts of different countries across the world, um, there's a shocking number of criminals who end up back in jail. Um, and it's just such a problem, particularly because prison is meant to be a deterrent from committing further crimes. It's meant to improve society. It's meant to remove that person from other people for a period of time. And then the ideal idea then is that they're sent back into a, into society rehabilitated. That often doesn't happen, unfortunately, which creates this kind of cycle of reoffending. Um, and it's dangerous and unfortunate. Um, but there is evidence that working with a therapy dog, um, either in sort of uh, specific sessions that are booked through a mental health services unit or in a program where they are match made with a rescue dog and that dog lives in the cell with them, um, that that reduces their rates of reoffending um, and gives them a better chance of getting out of prison and staying out of prison. Well, then there's the other side of the coin, the, the dogs that help people who are victims of crime, in many cases, the court therapy dogs. I didn't know there was such a thing as a court therapy dog. You don't think of a dog as something that would be allowed into, a, into something as kind no. of... Um, Sterile, formal, yeah. So, Kate, tell me about Gwen, the court therapy dog. Well, I, I actually heard about Gwen originally from my sister, who's a lawyer in Sydney, and she um, would go along and defend her clients, and she told me that sometimes there was a Labrador at court. And I was like, I was like you. I was like, what? You know, a dog doesn't, it doesn't seem like, the, a court doesn't seem like the right place for a dog. But as it turns out, perhaps it's exactly the right place for a dog. So I met this dog called Gwen, who was trained through Guide Dogs New South Wales. And I will not say she's a failed guide dog, but she did try and train to be a guide dog. But it was decided that her temperament was better suited to being a companion dog rather than a guide dog. There's a very specific set of kind of behavioural criteria that a yeah, guide the difference? needs to comply. Well, a guide dog basically just needs to be very responsible, very open to training, um, very well behaved and very capable of being able to guide a blind person through the world. And a lot of dogs go through, uh, I think there's only a 50% success rate in guide dog training programs. A lot of them kind of drop out of the program. Um, it's a long program where they as puppies are trained in basic obedience and then trained to guide a blind person through the world. And it's a difficult job, and a lot of them do not satisfy the criteria by the end of the training program. Gwen was one of those, and basically they just decided that Gwen was so gentle and loving and well-behaved and had such a sweet disposition that she would be better as a sort of emotional support dog. Um, so she ended up getting a job as a court companion. Um, so her owner, Julie, who wanted to, who was looking for an, an opportunity to volunteer and do something good for the community, uh, decided to enroll in this program with Guide Dog New South Wales. And um, she now takes her several mornings a week to some courts in Western, in the western suburbs of Sydney. I think it's Burwood Court that they go to. And they basically just provide emotional support for victims and people who are going through really stressful situations at a court. What, in the courtroom itself or pre-going pre no, into the pre, courtroom? pre-courtroom. So at the moment they're not, in Australia, they're not allowed in the actual courtroom. I believe in parts of America they are. Um, there have been circumstances in which people have had to testify um, and they've been allowed to have a support dog with them um, for comfort. And it's been a huge, especially for children and um, in particular children who are victims of sexual assault cases. Um, there have been some beautiful examples of them being able to give a testimony when they haven't been able to do it otherwise, once they have a dog by their side. But no, for the time being, the Court Companion Program in New South Wales is 
the dog is more likely to be in the victim services department. So in sort of like the special safe space working waiting room that victims and witnesses spend time in before they actually go into court. So it's more a case that they would have a snuggle while they're sort of preparing to go into court, which can make all the difference if you just need a little moment of solace and joy and comfort. That's so out of left field and so lovely and compassionate. Yeah, it, it seems is, isn't like it? a wonderful idea. Yeah, it's it's a completely lovely idea. Um, and it's sort of, I think, just taking off. I think there are obviously a lot of people who are uncomfortable with the idea of having an animal in a court, in a place of law. Um, that is a very sort of formal environment. And people also, I mean, there are sort of defence lawyers who believe that a victim with a dog is sort of more... Um, endearing to a, a jury um, and potentially there would be some sort of dog bias going on. So there are certainly arguments to be heard against it and, you know, there are allergies and cultural sort of reasons that people don't like to be around dogs. But I think if it was able to sort of be safely implemented, it could be just a wonderful program if it was um, rolled out so the dogs were actually allowed in the courtroom. I think that could be a really interesting and potentially wonderful thing. You know, I've I've known people in my life who have had to um, go through the unfortunate situation of being in a legal scenario in a traumatic kind of way and I can imagine that a little moment with a dog, a bit of company in the courtroom would have made a huge difference to that experience. Then there's Teddy, a dog you met with his owner, Andy. Yeah. Tell me about Teddy and Andy. <laughs> I love Teddy and Andy. Well, Andy is a 65-year-old man who um, got Teddy when he was still married. He's, in the last couple of years, had a rather messy divorce um, and ended up moving house, and two of his four sons don't speak to him, and it's been just sort of a very deeply unpleasant situation. But before that, any of that happened, um, he got this rescue dog called Teddy, or Ted for short. Basically, Andy went through cancer um, and then later went through pneumonia, which turned very nasty, um, and he ended up being put into a coma. What, a medically induced coma? Yeah. Basically, throughout his recovery from cancer, he had the dog by his side at all times, and he believes he was able to transfer back into normal life because he was able to take the dog for a walk several times a day, and he had this company over the period of time. You know, and I, I completely relate to that because I know how important it is to have a dog by your side when you're just in bed and unable to leave the house. Um, but the, probably the most remarkable moment was that uh, he was in a coma and they were hoping he would wake up. Uh, Andy's wife at the time um, saw that there was a therapy dog working in the hospital and said to the nurse who is tending to her husband, you know, we have this dog, Teddy. Teddy and Andy are inseparable. They love each other more than anything. They're as close as a man and a dog could be. What do you think of me bringing in our dog? And the nurse, you know, nurses are the best people in the world. She said, you know what, I technically didn't tell you that you could, but if you did, maybe I just wouldn't see that you brought the dog in. And so the wife brought the dog in, smuggled the dog in in a grocery bag and um, and the dog basically jumped up onto Andy's bed, barked once and he woke up. So it's this very sweet thing where the sound of his dog barking was the one thing to wake him up from a coma. Um, and quite remarkably, after he did that, Andy decided that he wanted to be able to offer Teddy's services as a therapy dog um, to other people who'd been through medical procedures and illnesses. So he got him trained as a therapy dog and he goes back to the same hospital that he attended and takes Teddy around to visit people, mostly stroke patients. And they go for sort of three hours twice a week to go and visit people at the hospital that he was once in so that Teddy can tend to people who need a little bit of extra TLC. So I think it's a beautiful story, and they're quite a remarkable pair. Andy has since gone through a tragedy. His sister died, and again, he sort of was incredibly grateful for having Teddy around throughout that grief. What does he say about Teddy? Uh, just that it's it's not possible for a man to love a dog more than he does. He, say, he says, Teddy is my life. Again and again, when I met him, he said that phrase, Teddy is my life. And I believe that, I think... His whole existence at the moment 
revolves around his dog and I'm so glad that he has him because I think it would be potentially a lonely time for him through sickness and through divorce and through grief. He no longer works. Um, his main friends are dog park friends, people he's met through other dogs. Uh, his main activities throughout the week are taking the dog to the park up to four times a day and taking the dog to the hospital to do his job. So, you know, I believe him when he says the dog is his life, and I think it's a beautiful thing. You know, a while back we had Bernie Shakeshaft on, on this program, Bernie who runs the amazing Backtrack Youth Works program for at-risk kids in rural New South Wales. He brings kids onto a property, and the dogs, there's a whole bunch of dogs, and each dog picks one of the kids. And he said the thing, the effect it has on these kids who have often have come from these awful home situations is that the dog doesn't judge them. Mm. It, doesn't, it doesn't care about what they've been. It has no knowledge of what. It just seems to, it seems to not judge them or offer, and, and offer itself up to their care as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I would believe that completely. I see that with a lot of people that I've met who have dogs, that they, they tend to make us the best versions of ourselves because they tend to bring out our sweetest nature and our, our instinct to care and to be gentle and to be patient and to be kind. And I think dogs can really inspire people to be, to be better people. What a pleasure to speak with you, Kate, and thank you so much. And you. Thank you so much for having me. Kate Lever's book is called Good Dog. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. For more like this, hit subscribe or check out the ABC Listen app for podcasts ad-free.